Dzień dobry. I want to talk about where did all our time go? Is the volume good? Is it all right? Higher? Is this better? All right. How about this? Is it okay? All right, very good. Let's get started. So where did all our time go? So when Pavel told me the conference theme, I had a variety of ideas that just instantly popped into my head, thinking about the unintended outcomes of technology. And so what I'd like to do is share those ideas with you today. And so I just want to start off by saying that I think today's technology is incredible. It's incredible. It's amazing. I just can't believe how good our technology is, except for that. Um, when I got started in computers, I never had any idea that we'd have the technology that we have today. It's really quite extraordinary. So I thought it'd be interesting for, you know, there's many ways of telling the story, but I thought I'd tell it from my own personal point of view, which is to compare the PC that I first had when I started my career to the PC that I just bought. I've got an amazing HP laptop. It's really fantastic. So just compare what I had then to what I have today. So in terms of CPUs, uh, I had what, it, what is known at the time as a Turbo XT, uh, so it had a, a CPU speed of 12 megahertz, uh, so I'm very old, obviously, uh, but today it's 2.4 gigahertz, so that's an improvement of 200 times. If you don't consider the cores, if you consider the cores, it might be more of 800 times improvement. In terms of memory, uh, we're going from 600K to 16 gigabytes, so that's an improvement of 25 thousand times. In terms of storage, going from 20 megabytes to 1 terabyte, that's an improvement of 50,000 times. In terms of display, going from 640 by 480 to uh, 1920 by 1080, that's an improvement of 6.75, which is smaller compared to the other numbers, but if you could consider their color space, it's more of an improvement of like 400,000 times. Networking speed, uh, going from uh, uh, dial-up modem to today's uh, broadband, network bandwidth, it's more of uh, an improvement of 25,000 times. So it's really quite extraordinary how good things are. We have an extraordinary ability with computation power. We're walking around with incredible power in our pockets. It's really quite extraordinary what we have today. Um, I had a video conference recently with a client. I did a uh, remote training and we did it, I was for a team in Australia, literally on the other side of the globe, and the video quality was fantastic, the audio quality was fantastic, and it was virtually free. It's really quite extraordinary that we can do this today. We have amazing apps now. We have highly intuitive apps that we can download and instantly get value out of. It's really quite extraordinary. We have never been more productive in the history of mankind. So, I think it's really quite extraordinary where we are today with respect to technology. There's just one problem though, and that is, I don't have any free time. I just don't. I just don't, it's, it's, I just don't have time to do anything anymore. It's really quite extraordinary. I just don't have time. And furthermore, the people I work with don't have any time either. Everybody's got a full calendar. Everybody's doing way too much. My clients don't have any free time. Whenever I'm trying to do anything, it's very, very difficult to schedule meetings because they're so, so busy. My children don't have time either. Nobody in my family has time. So it's really quite extraordinary how little time we have, even though we've got this amazing computational ability and these very, very productive apps. I'm assuming you don't have time either. I just wrote a book recently, it's called Intuitive Design. I wrote this book with the idea that my reader is someone who doesn't have time to read books. I'm now working on a service, a design service, where we do design reviews, and I'm assuming that our target users are design teams that don't have time to do the work themselves. Nobody has any time anymore. So my question is, where did all our time go? If we have all this amazing technology and this amazing productivity, you think we'd have more free time rather than less. So of course, uh, millennials are studied very uh, in very much detail, so uh, looking at uh, millennial media habits is a very good place to get started. So uh, it's uh, very easy to find data like this. So looking at media engagement for millennials, first of all, apparently millennials spend 18 hours a day consuming media. I don't even know how that's possible. But that's extraordinary. 18 hours a day, 72% are watching videos on YouTube, 60% on Netflix, 
46% on pay TV, 22% are watching traditional TV, 17% are gaming, and finally 14% are watching movies and sports on TV. I'm sure you've seen many scenes like this. We're just absorbed with our technology. Every spare moment we're spending on our devices. I, I think this is quite interesting. Do you see the, what's unusual in this picture here? Right? We have the old lady without the smartphone, and she's the only one who's paying attention. She's truly in the moment. Everyone else is messing around with their phones, trying to record what's going on. I bet she has free time. So let's talk about the tyranny of free apps. You know, the amazing thing is we've got all these free apps, but of course they're not really free, so I put free in quotes. I just want to explore a little bit where these free apps make their money. So I've heard recently that Instagram is considered to have a market value of about $100 billion. Now, of course, it's owned by Facebook. They're not a separate company, but the speculation is if they were a separate company, they would have a market cap of $1 billion. They have... 1 billion monthly active users, so if we do the simple math, that means the market cap per user is $100. And I've also found a statistic that the typical Android user spends 53 minutes a day on Instagram, which I find incredible, but nevertheless, that's what the data is showing. So if we amortize that $100 over that 53 minutes a day over a period of five years, which is typically what's done, uh, that ends up to be six cents per hour. And, of course, you'll have to convert that to, to Swatis on your own. But that's not a lot of money. Uh, but at least you're making six cents an hour, right, from using Instagram? Actually, no, I'm, of course, I'm joking. You don't make anything. Facebook makes the six, six cents an hour, which isn't a lot of money, but they don't seem to mind. So what we're doing when we're using these free apps is, in effect, we are working for Facebook for six cents an hour. But they're not paying us. They're just making the money off. So that's why the free apps are free. Now this is a screenshot from my smartphone. I've got an Android that I really love. And you'll notice a big hole in the middle right there. That is where Facebook used to be. I removed Facebook from my phone four months ago. Pavel, you've done the same? A year ago. And I'll tell you, it feels great. I feel liberated from not having to worry about Facebook. So I want to just share why we, why remove Facebook with you. So first of all, I want my time back. I wasn't a big Facebook user to begin with, but even so, it was enough where it was noticeable, just being constantly interrupted throughout the day with Facebook demanding my attention. It really is just a spy app, to be quite honest. If you uh, have, people have done this lately, they've looked at the data that your phone is sending to Facebook, and it's extraordinary. They are capturing everything about you. Whether or not you're using the app, they know what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're doing it. It also has a very abusive set of terms of service. And so you hear this in the news quite a lot where they'll do outrageous things and they'll say, well, you accepted our terms of service, so apparently that's okay. So I've removed Facebook from my app. I have not closed my Facebook account, though. I still have a Facebook account. And so Facebook really, really wants me to pay attention to them. So they're constantly sending me emails telling me about all the amazing things that all my friends are doing that I'm missing out on. I'm constantly getting notifications asking me to go back and check. And I'm trying as best as I can to ignore all these things. Uh, this is the same screenshot I showed a moment before. But another thing I see on apps is what I call badge spam. I think that's probably the, the accepted term. But notice that LinkedIn is telling me that I've got 23 notifications. Actually, I don't have 23 notifications. If I'm lucky, I have maybe one or two. Maybe it's somebody's birthday or something. I don't know what it is, but they're constantly wanting me to go and check the app right now to see what's new because we're afraid of missing out on something. They really demand our attention. This is a screenshot of the Facebook Terms of Service. Has anyone actually read the Facebook Terms of Service? Anyone? No? All right. Well, I've read most of it, and here is my summary of the Facebook Terms of Service. So number one, we are spying on you all the time. Number two, your stuff is actually our stuff now. Number three, we can do anything we want with it. And number four, you can't do anything about it. So doesn't that sound great? You know, sign me up. I accept. This is wonderful. 
So I did remove Facebook from my, my uh, smartphone, as I mentioned, but I, I still have Snapchat around and some other social media apps, including Messenger. And if you go and look at the permissions they have, they basically have permission to do anything. Almost all of the social media apps have access to everything on your device. Of course, the camera, you would presume, but things like location, phone, SMS, and storage, really? Do you really need access to all this stuff? They take it, whether you know it or not, you have given your social media apps complete control of your phone. Another thing I want to explore is where did our social life go? You know, is technology really bringing us together or is it tearing us apart? That's a very difficult question to answer. This advertisement campaign, which was known as the Silhouette ad for, for the iPod, if you remember the iPod, this came from 2000, 2003, so this is 15 years old. And what's interesting about it is it shows people dancing and having fun, you know, being together and enjoying music and, and partying in the street, that sort of thing. But the funny thing is, you know, it's 15 years since this ad came, campaign came out. I cannot recall of a single time where I saw someone with an iPod dancing in the street. I've never seen it, not even once. This is what I see. I see the guy in the hoodie all by himself, isolated from anybody else listening to his music. I see this all the time. I see this all the time as well. You know, this is not exactly dancing in the street. This is not exactly what the ad was suggesting. I see this, unfortunately, all the time, sometimes with my family, unfortunately, but we're all together, but we're on our phones. We're distracted, we're focused on our technology. I see this in restaurants all the time. It's absolutely crazy. People going out on dates and they're on their phones. Uh, this woman doesn't look especially impressed that she's not having a great time, but the guy's really having a good time. On my, my uh, trip out here, I left from Montreal, and what I noticed with Air Canada is that you can check in without any human contact whatsoever. They have the kiosks, which are very familiar at this point. Everybody's seen the kiosks. But what's new is they also have the baggage um, tags that they uh, automatically give to you. You put the tag on yourself, and you put your luggage uh, onto the, to the carousel by yourself. There's no human involvement whatsoever. People are completely out of the picture now. I wanted to, uh, to show you an advertisement that I think is absolutely fantastic just to share with you. I think uh, something that really encapsulates what I'm seeing here. So let me try to shift this over. <coughs> Isn't it interesting where technology enters the picture? We're not dining together, we're eating alone. And technology is enabling that. Is that a good thing? I think it's an unintended consequence. All right, but it's not all bad. So I do want to point out the reason I'm here today is because of LinkedIn. I got together with Pavel. I, I saw some announcement that he had. I'm like, hey, Pavel, it's been a while. How are things going? Next thing you know, I'm here. So, uh, you know, there is a lot to be said for social media. It does have benefits, but it also has some downsides. So going back to this question, where did our social life go? Is technology really bringing us together or tearing us apart? That's a very difficult question to answer. But it's not obviously all good, is it? 
All right, a friend of mine wrote a book called Evil by Design, so I think that's kind of an interesting idea here. So just to ex explore kind of a hypothetical, suppose we had a design machine that could crank out great designs immediately, without human interaction necessarily, and we had this ability to create automated designs, we had this ability to do immediate A-B tests, maybe SEO or whatever, immediately get results and immediately iterate and uh, just come up with any sort of uh, design optimization instantly. Now let's further suppose that this machine had a, a knob with three settings and it enabled us to optimize for great usability, for maximizing user value, or for maximizing corporate profit. Which setting do you suppose our CEO would want to set this machine to? Profit, right? Isn't that going to happen, right? We're going to maximize profit. What happens when we design to maximize profit? And the answer is we end up with a lot of dark patterns. We end up with situations where we are manipulating users to do things that are not necessarily in their best interest. Why? Because that makes more money. If we optimize for profit, we are optimizing for manipulation. We're optimizing to manipulate our users and to waste their time. So if you're not familiar with dark patterns, this is pretty much the most famous one. This is from Ryanair. They have a new website now. They fixed this. But if you're not familiar with this, what are you supposed to do here? Right? We're, we're making an airline reservation. What do you suppose we're supposed to do? Right? We're supposed to fill in our first name, our last name, and our country of residence. Isn't that what we're doing? First name, last name, country of residence? Well, if, that's, if you scan the UI, that's what you're doing. But if you read the UI carefully, what you're doing is you're giving your name and you're buying AXA travel insurance. And if you don't want AXA travel insurance, you have to choose no travel insurance required, which is conveniently located between Latvia and Lithuania. So this is known as a dark pattern, where we are manipulating users into doing things that are against their best interests. This makes a lot of money. Here's my own example of this. I was making a booking a, a flight with Aer Lingus. I have to accept the terms and conditions, right? Isn't that what I'm doing? Accepting the terms and conditions? I have to check that off right here. Isn't that what I'm doing? Actually, no. Check here if you prefer not to accept the guaranteed amount. Okay, what is the guaranteed amount? I have no idea what that means. The guaranteed amount you pay. So what they're basically doing is manipulating us into accepting an unacceptable or an unreasonable exchange rate. It's a dark pattern. They're manipulating us. It makes it look like we're accepting the terms and conditions. So it's all about the money. If we optimize for money, we're going to have these situations where we're really abusing our users. So for me, I think the biggest unexpected outcome of technology, modern technology, is that modern technology and social media have, has created a conflict between our user goals and our business goals. And our business goals are winning. So what's the point of this? Well, I'm not here to complain. Anybody can complain. I wanted to share with you what I think we need to do as designers to think about this problem. Right? So we need to understand what we're doing, and we really do need to think more about the user's side than the business side. We need to balance those out a little bit. It can't all be about the money. So, uh, by the way, so of course, Google has the, the, the or had, I should say, had the, had the corporate motto of don't be evil, which they no longer have anymore. And I love this photo because it's, it looks like it's in a museum, right? Which is the right place for that motto right now. All right, so we need a UX code of ethics. So I'd just like to share with you what I think that code might be. So first of all, we need to respect our users' time. We don't want to waste our users' time. Let's not abuse our users. Let's not take their time for granted. Let's give them their free time back. Let's respect our users' focus. Don't interrupt them or distract them unnecessarily, especially when they're driving. That is absolutely crazy, people texting on their phones and whatnot. Don't do the bad spam. Don't constantly demand attention for your app. Respect the user's privacy. Don't gather or disclose without permission. Don't spy on your users. Number four, respect the user's choice. Help them make informed decisions and give them the right to opt into things rather than forcing them to opt out of things they didn't even know they had. Number five, respect the user's space. Don't abuse your terms of service. Don't abuse your permissions. Use the minimum privileges, not the maximum ones. And finally, number six, respect the user's humanity. Provide a human alternative, a right to appeal if some sort of robot or algorithm is making a judgment on a user, on a person, they should have the right to appeal that judgment. And finally, we should have the right not to use stuff. If I don't want to use Facebook, I should be able to do so. 
All right, so of course money's involved here, but I'm going to make the business case that I believe in the future, so I'm going to make a prediction. I believe in the future that respecting users will become the ultimate competitive advantage. It's going to enable us to compete with the big social media companies because they're abusing the users. Uh, they're not respecting their users. If we respect our users, that's going to give us a competitive advantage that I think people are going to appreciate more and more over time. All right, one final thought here is that I started by talking about the amazing technology that we have today. And I just want to ask the question, is our amazing technology being exploited to capture our users' time and attention? I think the answer to that question is yes. And I really think we should reconsider that. All right, that's all I have. Jenkuya Barzo.